Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I had a video already ready to go. It's on the case of the Queen and Nur, but I'm pushing that back so that I can talk about a news article that just landed while it's still fresh. So this is Environment Minister Defends Purchase of AR-10 Rifles for Conservation Officers. And they note, the federal list of banned firearms includes an exemption for peace officers. They say, the Department of Environment intends to purchase 20 semi-automatic AR-10 rifles despite the inclusion of the weapons in a recently released ban introduced by the federal government. And the Environment Minister Pauline Frost said that the federal government has a specific exemption for peace officers, such as conservation officers, and the employees equipped with the weapons will be trained. Now, when they say will be trained, I'm wondering, you know, many police officers get something like 50 rounds a year for training, which is less than most sort of license holders will spend on one range trip. But so I don't know what sort of training they're talking about, hopefully better than average. But uh, regardless, this article is kind of being a little misleading here because it implies that the exemption is in the, uh, the order in council. But what we're actually looking at is an exemption that's in the criminal code. Section 11707 uh, provides, this is under the heading of, uh, just pull it up here, exempted persons. So they say, notwithstanding any other provision of this act, but subject to 117.1, which is firearms prohibitions, no public officer is guilty of an offense under this act or the Firearms Act by reason only that the public officer, A, possesses a firearm, prohibited weapon, restricted weapon, prohibited device, any prohibited ammunition or an explosive substance, in the course of or for the purpose of the public officer's duties or employment. This is an important section because most police officers do not hold a firearms license. And so, but for this section, they could also, they could be charged for, you know, going around town with their sidearm or with an AR-15 or whatever it is that they're equipped with. Now, there's other provisions here that allow them to do some other kind of funky things. You know, subsection D. Exports or imports, a component or part designed exclusively for use in the manufacture of or assembly into an automatic firearm in the course of a public officer's duties or employment. And E, in the course of the public officer's duties or employment, alters a firearm so that it is capable of or manufactures or assembles any firearm with intent to produce a firearm that is capable of discharging projectiles in rapid succession during one pressure of the trigger. So, automatic firearms. And G, alters a serial number on a firearm in the course of the public officer's duties or employment. So there's a few reasons why these are there. Uh, number one is police acting as undercover officers. Because if you're in deep cover with a criminal organization and they say, hey, we've got a bunch of guns, but you know, you better scratch out the serial number, you don't want the officer going, hmm, well, wouldn't that be illegal? Because, of course, it's illegal, and that's not the sort of thing you bring up if you're undercover. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes they have RCMP technicians who might need to do things like test to see, can this be made automatic easily? They need to be able to do that and be exempted, so that's what that provision is there for. So these basically allow for a broad swath of things. Uh, public officers includes peace officers, it includes members of the military, it includes people training to be police officers. It includes a whole bunch of things. So that's sort of the exemption there. Now, when we think about the AR-10, uh, this was recently included in the ban that was sort of quite spectacularly introduced as a result of or in response to a shooting event. Now, why do they want these rifles? Well, what they're saying here is uh, they're saying that these rifles are necessary uh, to deal with human wildlife conflict. Well, so what they're saying is they got to shoot animals with these. And they're being called hypocritical over this. So why are they being called hypocritical for saying we need some semi-automatic firearms for shooting animals? Especially given that a lot of hunters are out there with semi-automatic firearms. And the reason for that is that Trudeau, in his infinite wisdom, has said this was when he was bringing in the ban. Uh, these weapons were designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. There is no use and no uh, place for such weapons in Canada. That's what Trudeau said about these sorts of issues, or these sorts of firearms, in implementing the ban. So, which is it? Are they, 
you know, are these AR-10s only suitable for killing the largest number of people? In which case, maybe they should be saying, well, maybe you should be getting something designed for bears. Or is it maybe that Trudeau is full of crap when he says this? I kind of believe the, the conservation officers here because they indicate that they tested various rifles and reviews indicated the semi-automatic patrol rifle is easy to carry, which it is. They're lightweight. They're, they're a great rifle uh, and provides a quick and effective shot placement. It's proven to be extremely quick and effective in both obtaining a sight picture and rapidly fire effective shots in high stress situations, such as engaging a charging grizzly bear at close range. So I want to be clear here. I have no problem in, th in theory with the conservation officers having these rifles because, you know, they might have to deal with a charging bear. And absolutely, you should have the best tools available because a charging bear is not something you want to take half measures on. That's a big deal because a charging bear will straight up kill you. It's just, it's how they work. It's what bears do if they are inclined to do so. You know, most bears are peaceful. They're not inclined to do anything. But if they decide to kill you, they are more than able to do it. They've got the equipment. They've, you know, sharp pointy teeth and, you know, hand knives. So I've got no problem with the conservation officers having these rifles. The problem is, is when we've got our elected officials telling the public, listen, these things have no purpose but to kill people. And we see that that's clearly BS. Clearly, these things have other purposes. And I note, here in Alberta, it is legal to hunt bears. So wouldn't a rifle that is good for bears be good for bears? That kind of seems like a tautology to me, that the good for bears rifle is good for hunting bears. So that seems like a legitimate use. It seems like Trudeau maybe doesn't know what he's talking about, maybe isn't being honest, perhaps. So I've got some issues with this. And again, they're not with the conservation officers, but I also have a, a bit of a modest proposal for how we fix the law here. And it goes like this. Let's set up one universal standard, which basically says, aside from undercover operations, because I can see a need for special rules for undercover operations, but just say in terms of ordinary police duties and in terms of ordinary conservation officer duties, their right to possess, use, and carry firearms uh, flows from their status as citizens. So eliminate all special provisions for, uh, for the police. Military, of course, separate category because they've got to do things that are military things. But essentially saying, if conservation officers need AR-10s to be in the woods because of bears, then so do the people who might be in the woods, who might be the first people the bear are attacking. Why does a conservation officer have to put down a bear? Well, probably because it's been a bear that was aggressive towards people before that, and maybe people who didn't have the AR-10. So I just think that might be a better system. It might bring the uh, the Canadian gun-owning public online with the uh, the police here, because if our streets are so safe that uh, that nobody ever needs a means to defend themselves, then surely the police are good too, especially given that the police tend to move in groups. Uh, they tend to be trained in physical combat. They tend to be, you know, bigger, larger individuals. Certainly a police officer is going to be much better at facing an attacker than I will. You know, I have tiny scrawny arms. I am a small person. I've got a bad back and I've got asthma. I am not going to be winning any MMA competitions anytime soon. And there's no way that I'd be able to overpower one police officer, let alone the, the fact that police officers typically have friends with them. Anyway, I realize when I say this is a modest proposal, I don't expect anyone to take it seriously, but it's kind of food for thought when we start thinking about these bans. Anyway, I just wanted to sort of vent on that. It's a uh, it annoys me when I see this. And as much as I'd be tempted to say, listen, you know, if they're saying that the public can't have it, then maybe the conservation officers shouldn't have it. I think the proper solution is really, maybe we should all, you know, have access to this 
where it's acknowledged that these are useful and that there are reasonable reasons to have it. Not that reasons to have it are really a criteria we apply to anything else in my life. You know, I don't necessarily have a great reason to have a fountain pen over, you know, a ballpoint pen, but I like it better. So, yeah. Anyway, um, there's a couple of things here. Another thing I want to say, sort of while I've got your attention here, uh, Larry Wilson, who is Tracy Wilson's father, she's of course of the CCFR, has passed away after his battle with Parkinson's and a long life. Uh, he's a Canadian Forces veteran. He's done a lot to serve this country. And so I'm going to leave a link uh, in the description below as to where you can go if you want to make a donation in his uh, in his memory. Uh, certainly, I'll be doing so, and I encourage you to do so if you have the means, because I know that uh, these are very difficult times for a lot of us. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not really good with, uh, with this sort of thing. I'm not uh, somebody with profound words or... Uh, that finds dealing with this terribly easy, but uh, I wanted to pass that along. Uh, I also want to thank you for watching. Uh, give the uh, a shout out to my te uh, Patreon supporters at the ten dollar level: my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, Mark D, General Counsel of the CCFR, uh, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, Jean Alexander Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sights and Arms Limited. Chaba Hollow, Peter H., Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, Alvaro Bataille, DF, Stacey Cartmel, Tactical Advantage TV Canada, Ian S., Dave Leslie, Juan, Donald Duncan, Stefan Conquist, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Ian Hutchinson, Rory, Travis, BC Bushcraft Leather, John Singarty, Misa Komarevich, and then at the $20 level, Kevin Fleet and Dale Nesbitt, $30, Steve Browning, and at the $50 level, George, Demo, and People of Canada. Once again, thank you for watching. I guess this is a bit rantier than I usually like to be. Um, I'll go back to law probably tomorrow, but uh, thank you, and I hope I've armed you with knowledge.